Oh. <laughs> So I'd like to call to order this. We got a lot of echo going on here. Al, uh, he's on, and Dannenberg, are you all muted? I'm muted. Al, you're you need to mute yourself. Okay, all right. I've still got a lot of. Okay, so we have some technical difficulties, as you can tell. We're all on Zoom and we're getting a lot of echo. So are we good? I'm still getting quite a bit of echo. It's not going to get better. We're good. All right. Again, I'll call this meeting of the Board of Commissioners. The date is February 23rd. And uh, we are dealing with some technical issues. So we're gonna try the best that we can. Um, we're asking everyone to remain muted except when they need to uh, respond to either the roll call or um, some question that they might have. So uh, first we're gonna start with the invocation by Commissioner Danberg, and then we're going to have the Pledge of Allegiance uh, led by Sherry Sales. Please rise.
I'm doing. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. So bear with us as we uh, go through this meeting in a little bit different way. Sherry is gonna call the roll and uh, please unmute yourself as she does so. Go ahead, Sherry. Mr. Garcia. Here. Mr. Bauman. Here. Mr. Zylstra. Here. Mr. Dannenberg. Mr. Mepelink. Here. Mr. Terpstra. Here. Mr. Hofloor. Present. Mr. DeYoung. Here. Mr. Kyer. Here. here. Mr. Berg. I'm here. And Mr. Fenn. Here. We have a Thank you. Presentation of petitions and communications. I have none. Thank you. Uh, and now we have a update from public health. And I think Dr. Heibel is going to be on first and then Daryl last hour. So uh, Dr. Heibel, if you want to start. Yeah, thanks Roger. Well, first of all, thanks for the opportunity to meet with us today and giving us a chance to meet with you and update you on COVID-19. Uh, as you may know, Lisa is on a well-deserved vacation. She's scheduled to come back tomorrow. But in the meantime, she asked us to fill in for her today. So uh, Daryl Glassauer, our senior epidemiologist, uh, whom I think you're all well acquainted with, is going to be giving you a picture of what's happening here locally. We also have Jennifer Sorek standing by. She's our very fine emergency preparedness coordinator. She's been one of the lead uh, leaders and organizers of our COVID-19 vaccination clinic. So she's standing by in case we have any questions about the clinic. And uh, before I hand it over to Darrell, I just want to take a minute or so to update you on a few COVID-19 uh, issues and then maybe put things in perspective a little bit here. Just first of all, to refresh your memory, the first case of COVID-19 in the U.S. was reported January 21st of last year, and the first death was reported on February 6th. So it's just a little over a year, and already we have had 228 and a half million cases of COVID-19 reported in this country and 505,000 deaths. So the number of US cases is the highest in the world right now. And it's equal to the number of cases that are found uh, that have, had, uh, have occurred rather in India, Brazil, Russia, and the United Kingdom combined. And they have the second, third, and fourth high and fifth highest numbers uh, respectively in the world. So we match the, the next four countries as far as number of cases. And to put things in perspective, when we look at the number of deaths in the United States so far, just in this uh, 12 or 13 months time, uh, our current COVID-19 deaths account, uh, account exceeds the total number of all US combat casualties in World War I, World War II, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War by over 80,000 deaths. So uh, really a sobering figure there. And then if dealing with this one virus that we have here now isn't enough, we now have three new uh, highly contagious variant strains in the US, including over 1600 cases of the UK B117 strain that's been found in 44 states, including Michigan. And right now, Michigan has 120 cases, I'm sorry, 210 cases, which is the highest uh, number of cases in the United States behind Florida. There are about 100 cases ahead of us. And that includes an outbreak at the state prison in Ionia. So as I said, it's a highly contagious strain. It's expected to be the predominant strain in the US by next month. And if you hadn't heard, we unfortunately, uh, there was a case that was identified of this strain in Muskegon this past weekend. And we're not sure exactly how these strains are gonna be affected by our current vaccines, but Moderna and Pfizer are both looking at whether or not it's gonna be necessary to modify their current vaccines to deal with these variant strains. And Moderna is already considering whether or not a third uh, dose is gonna be necessary uh, to their vaccine. 
So that's kind of the bad news, but there's some good news out there and Darrell's gonna share that with you in just a minute uh, because our rates are coming down and the testing rate here in Michigan as of yesterday, when we're talking about testing positivity rates was 3.16 and that's the lowest it's been in a long time. Uh, also, our vaccine clinic continues to expand as we receive uh, more allotments or larger allotments of the vaccine. And we've also been getting some really good reviews and comments from the people that have gone through there. And on the vaccine front, things are looking better there too. Uh, Pfizer has announced that next month it's going to be able to increase its vaccine production from 4 million to 5 million uh, every week. And Moderna is going to increase their vaccine production to 40 a month. So that's good news there. Some more good news is that their uh, recent study came out pretty much over the weekend that said that if you've had COVID-19, even though you're supposed to get vaccinated, you, you may only need one dose of the vaccine rather than two doses. And that's been based on one primary study. Uh, so the FDA right now is still recommending two. But if they accept that recommendation or that finding, that could free up as many as 28 million doses of vaccine because that's the number of people who've recovered from COVID who would otherwise need two doses of vaccine. Uh, uh, now would only need one. Also, Pfizer has applied for permission to store their vaccines at a higher temperature. Uh, right now, they have to store it at minus 190 degrees. Uh, if that's approved, that was, this would allow us to push the vaccine out of the community more easily. Uh, that's something we really want to do because right now, primarily only hospitals, pharmacies, and health departments are able to store this vaccine because of the high cost of these specialized freezers. And also some good news is that this Friday, Johnson & Johnson's vaccine is going to be reviewed by an FDA panel for emergency use authorization. And if that is approved, and we suspect it will be, uh, it would be the third vaccine that's been approved here in the United States. Uh, one thing is it has been shown to be not as effective as the Pfizer or Moderna, Moderna vaccine in preventing disease, but it is highly effective in preventing hospitalizations and deaths. It's also, one vac it's also a one dose vaccine. It doesn't require the super low temperatures that, that Pfizer requires. So, there's a lot of good things going for this vaccine. So people ask, you know, which vaccine is the best one? And uh, like Dr. Fauci says, the best vaccine is the first one you can get. And then a final piece of good news on the vaccine front is that uh, vaccine clinical trials are scheduled to begin soon for children uh, ages 16 and under. And that's especially good news when we think about getting the kids back to school where we would like the teachers vaccinated and the students vaccinated as well. And then just before I turn it over to Darrell, the obvious question on everybody's mind is when are we going to get back to normal? And we know that anything can happen, but from what the experts are saying, they say that we may be able to start uh, see things start changing this summer and maybe a return toward normal as early as fall and maybe even back to normal by the holidays. That's just a guess though, and it's dependent on a lot of things and a lot of those things are under, uh, beyond our control. And I should mention that Dr. Fauci, uh, Fauci said a few days ago that uh, he expects that we're still gonna be wearing masks by the year 2022, so that's next year. But at least there seems to be a little bit of a glimmer of hope at the end of the tunnel. So with that, I'm turn it over to Darrell and uh, he'll give us a very fine update on what's going on here in Ottawa County. Hey, thank you, Dr. Heidel. I'm gonna share my screen. Commissioner Bergman, we just raised your hand and let me know if you can see the screen. Yes, I can see the screen. Perfect, thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I've been introduced, but for those who are on YouTube or streaming publicly, my name is Darrell Glasshauer and I'm an epidemiologist with the Ottawa County Department of Public Health. I'm here today just to give an update on surveillance here in Ottawa County for COVID-19 and also talk briefly about vaccination. As Dr. Heidel mentioned, there are variant COVID strains on the horizon, uh, but basically today I'm gonna talk about a lot of good news and I'm gonna move pretty quickly through some of these initial slides because my, uh, since my last update, there haven't been many changes. Uh, we continue to trend down and I just wanna be uh, respectful for all your time. So. 
moving on, let's jump right into the data. The first thing I want to talk about is just the volume of cases we're seeing each day here in Ottawa County. The main takeaway is that we had a lot of cases back in November and December. And to date, we're averaging about 33 cases a day over the last seven days. And this number is getting close to where we were back in the summer. Uh, so we're seeing some uh, return to levels that we haven't seen uh, in months. And so this is really encouraging to see that the case volume is coming down because it's more manageable from a public health perspective, calling folks, asking them about where they've been and what people may have been exposed. That's a lot easier to manage on a few dozen cases a day uh, rather than 400. When we look at the rates here in Ottawa County, uh, if you look at the figure here, just the main takeaway is the black line that you can see here. Um, the main thing here is the, uh, the continued downtrend. So overall, you can see that uh, the case rates continue to decline. Uh, in the past, we've had you know, things on the horizon like holidays and that were a concern for us because of increased socialization. But here uh, in this period of time in the year, we just don't see as many uh, holidays. And even though there's spring break coming up, at least the weeks ahead, I don't have any indication that these case rates will rebound. When we look at our overall positivity, it's more good news. Like Dr. Heidel mentioned, many of our cases, our, sorry, our positivity has declined below 4% over the last few days. And this data, as of about a week and a half ago, Ottawa County was hovering at about 4.2% positivity, much lower than we've seen in the past. We've seen a small decline in the number of tests that are being conducted each week. Last week, we had about 6,000 tests conducted. Um, there could be a number of reasons for this, but one of the main ones could easily be demand in the sense that there's not as much transmission, so there's not as many people that are symptomatic and seeking uh, care for testing. So this is also encouraging information, uh, basically saying that, that we're seeing a downtrend in cases and also positivity. When we back up and look at the overall metrics, on top is blue, the number of cases each week. I know this is very small print, but if you just imagine that this is just time, and right here on the right side is basically today, you can see that cases went up and they've come down and have basically been lower than each week prior to that. Hospitalizations have tapered off and deaths have also tapered off. So we're seeing a lot of encouraging news, not just in the number of cases, but also in the number of hospitalizations and deaths. Here in Ottawa County, our bed capacity in our hospitals is also remains uh, in good shape. Uh, although about 50% of our beds are usually occupied, I think that's probably our baseline. The main thing is the proportion of beds occupied by COVID-19 patients, which is well below 10% out of our 200 plus beds available. In our ICUs, again, we've returned to baseline for all of our beds and our COVID-19 uh, cases that are in ICU has hovered below 10% of all of our ICU beds. So this is, again, really encouraging information, not just downtrends, but the institutions that we're trying to protect uh, are in good shape to provide care for COVID-19 and all the other um, physical and medical ailments we may have. I'm just going to jump into vaccines here, bringing us back to the vaccine phases here in West Michigan or here in Michigan overall, and uh, just point out at least one difference from uh, two weeks ago, and that's that uh, agriculture and food processing workers were lumped in with essential frontline workers. They've been called out and moved up sooner in the overall vaccination schedule. So we're right here in the middle of February, you can see that all these different groups, including 65 to 74 year olds are eligible for vaccine. And in March per the state, agriculture and food processing workers will also be available, eligible to receive vaccine. So this is just a snapshot of who's eligible right now. When we look at Ottawa County for the coming week, this is a basic breakdown of the vaccination clinics that we have uh, coming up. We have uh, four kind of distinct vaccine clinics that are being offered by or uh, in partnership with Ottawa County Department of Public Health. We have one uh, today at the GVSU Meyer campus where we're going to be offering a thousand second doses. This is not a, there's no target population because of these are our folks that are coming back in. Uh, we're also offering one on Thursday at the Civic Center. It's for 65 plus education staff and diverse communities that are 65 plus and we'll have 1700 first doses there and you can read down the list. Roughly from all of the clinics that Ottawa County is uh, more involved with, there'll be about 3,700 doses that we'll be giving and about 4,500 doses that we'll be administering this week, either ourselves through Ottawa County Department of Public Health or through our partners and not displayed in this table above 
are about 740 doses that were transferred to or shared with local health care partners to help us have a wider reach. One thing I also want to point out is that there is going to be a vaccination clinic on Friday, uh, specifically for law enforcement and fire. That's going to be held at the Ottawa County Fillmore Complex, uh, kind of in the center of the county. And that's going to be done in partnership with Holland Hospital. So we're doing our best to reach the eligible populations and ensure that everyone has ample opportunity to receive vaccine. When we look in Ottawa County, backing out a little bit to the county overall, 58,000 doses have been given to Ottawa County residents. Uh, we're making pretty good progress, but we need to do, uh, keep, keep doing a, a good job of vaccinating our population because we're shooting for well over 30, 300,000 doses to our population to achieve our goals. And then when we look at specific age groups and one of the biggest uh, groups that's eligible for vaccination right now are persons age 65 plus. And uh, we have really good data available through the state of Michigan on their vaccine dashboard. Uh, and the data that you see on the screen here is for all of uh, all Ottawa County residents, not just Ottawa County residents that have received a dose through the Ottawa County Department of Public Health. So this is anyone that's received a dose, Kent County, Muskegon, Allegan, uh, from a different partner in Ottawa County. And overall, you can see that 18,000 uh, people age 65 plus have received at least one dose. And this is the equivalent of 40% of our population of people 65 plus. So this is um, really, really substantial and significant number just because that 40% of our folks 65 plus have some sort of potential immunity against COVID-19. And then the main metric, which is our goal is to vaccinate 70% of uh, folks in all of the eligible bands uh, with two doses of vaccine. And 20% approximately of persons 65 plus in Ottawa County have received two doses of vaccine. Our goal is 70%, so we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, but right now you can see that we've, we are continue to make substantial progress vaccinating our population. And then lastly, one of the uh, issues that's come up is just making sure that we're reaching the, our harder to reach population. So communities of color uh, and others that have uh, less access to care or less access to resources to even get signed up uh, to receive vaccines. So technology, uh, access to the internet, and even if there are language barriers, we wanna make sure that we're working to overcome them. Here in Ottawa County, and this is at clinics that uh, Ottawa County has uh, administered, uh, you can see that 8.7% of our population age 65 plus uh, are, are non-white or Hispanic in our population of those who we're giving doses to. This is higher than in Ottawa County's population uh, overall. So we are approaching uh, equity for this population and we're going to continue to monitor it and you know, actively do outreach to this population just to ensure that uh, we're making sure that there's access available to uh, folks in our community who may be less able to get vaccine than others. So I just kind of want to wrap things up saying that we continue to see community spread. I know that uh, I presented a, hopefully a lot of good news today, but our case uh, rates are still a little bit higher than we saw in the summer, but we're getting close to where we were uh, before the spike in September, October, November, and December. Case rates in lab positivity continue to come down and hospital capacity remains improved. I just want to encourage everyone to continue to mask, distance, and hand wash because these are all effective ways to prevent COVID-19. We began vaccination back in December, and so since then we've given, uh, through Ottawa, in Ottawa County, 58,000 doses to our residents. Among people age 65 plus, just to reiterate, 20% have completed their two-dose series. Our goal is 70%. And in Ottawa County, we continue to try to do our best to do outreach to our underserved populations, and I just want to point out that uh, we've reached about 8.7% of our non-white and Hispanic population here in Ottawa County um, who are aged 65 and older. And this is a little bit higher than um, that proportion in our overall population. Uh, so thank you commissioners for letting me speak today. That's it for me. Thanks Darrell. Are there any questions for Dr. Heibel or for uh, Darrell? Um, Mr. Chairman. I have one, Dr. Heidel, Commissioner Dannenberg here. Um, I don't know who's doing the scheduling, but I had an older gentleman and his wife um, in their 80s called me last week and they signed up for it, weren't hearing anything. Um, I asked them to call the health department R211 and 
after they had the wrong number, they got the right number and they got scheduled for that day. He called me back at night and he was so thrilled of how that operation worked. But I thought he said he went to Francis de Sales Church in Holland. So are them two numbers, the health department and 211 still good to tell people to call if they're not getting signed up and they're older 65? Ellen, we would defer that over to Jennifer Sorg. She's our uh, brains behind this and she's on the line here. So Jenny, you wanna take that one? Yes, I will doc, thank you. Um, yes, those are the two right numbers to call. So what we have is our two options for signing up. We have our survey button that I want a vaccine on our website. And then we also have the capability for those individuals who do not have technology, they can call our health department and be put on a list. And that list is for available appointments for no technology. And then we call those individuals when there are appointments available and we set an appointment for them. So that number last week they called and there were appointments available at St. Francis de Sales. There were some open appointments and that's how they got that appointment. So yes, they can call our um, main number and our main line and they get put on a, a list to be called when there are appointments available. Thank you, great job, appreciate it. Can they also call 211 to get those appointments? Uh, 211 does not have a direct link to the appointment list, but they do um, have information on other places they can get appointments in West Michigan, and they will refer them to other resources within West Michigan for appointments. So if they call 211, they'll refer them to who, whoever they need to be referred to, correct? Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Hey, Jennifer. It's Commissioner Garcia. So if someone signed through the internet and they haven't hurt anyone and they are 65 and older, are they just to wait then for an appointment uh, opportunity or, or should they follow the uh, phone call process? They are to wait for the appointment process. We have about, I wanna say 65,000 or more people signed up on that list. And each week what we do is we start with the oldest and move to the newest. So okay. each week what we do is we survey, say for instance, we have um, 1,700 appointments this week. We divide that out based on our equation of, we had 1,700 appointments. We take so many for educators and then whatever's left, we pull that list of 65 and older. And then we invite so many of that population to that list. So we're guiding to them. We're just slowly working through that list. We also know that um, we are providing lists um, based on our community partners. So we gave vaccine to Metro Health, we gave vaccine to Mercy Health, um, we gave vaccine to Noach, we gave vaccine to Spectrum Health, and we're giving them lists for those specific areas. Um, we gave them a list of our no tech appointments because they don't wanna drive all the way to Holland for the Civic Center. So we are actually sharing also our no tech list in, in addition, so they're not having to drive a long distance for appointments. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Sure. Dr. Heidel, I have a question for you. Um, you, you talked about, or, or maybe Darrell talked about the uh, fact that food processors are on the list. Will you be going to some of those large food processors and actually um, on-site uh, vaccinations or will you require them to take uh, time off or what are your plans there? I think, again, that's going to be Jennifer, but uh, to my knowledge, at this point, we don't have any plans. Jen, you want to say anything about that? Um, at this point, we are working to plan for that. We do not have the amount of vaccine to get to that population at this point in time because we're not through our current populations. Um, but when we get to that point, there will be a combination for that population. We are, Drell and Adeline Hambly are working on a plan to both push and pull. So that means we will pull them into our community vaccine clinics, but we will also push out to their facilities who have applied to be vaccine sites and who have also contracted with other places to go to those facilities. So we will try to do a combination effort wherever possible to get to as many people as possible as quickly as possible. That sounds great. That sounds like a win-win a for a lot of those especially the larger ones that are food processors. So thank you for that. Now, are there any other questions? If not, we're gonna move on and I wanna thank you all for um, your presentation today. No, thank you, Roger.
Okay, we're going to move on to public comments. Is there anyone in the public that would like to comment at this point in time? Uh, I don't see anyone here that. Is there anyone here that would like to in the in the room? If not, is there anyone online that would like to? Okay, all right. So we're going to move on to approval of the agenda. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Support. Been moved and supported. Comments or questions? Sherry, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Bauman? Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. Mr. Mappelink? Yes. Mr. Hofloor? Yes. Mr. DeYoung? Yes. Mr. Zal? Yes. Mr. Terps? Yes. Mr. Kyers? Yes. Mr. Dannenberg? Yes. Mr. Fenske? Yes. Mr. Bergman? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Next thing is action on, and reports under that. Uh, consent resolutions. Mr. Fenske, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to make the motion to approve consent resolutions one through four. Support. Been moved and supported. Comments or questions? Sherry, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Terpstra? Yes. Mr. Hoflo? Yes. Mr. Zell? Yes. Mr. Kyer? Mr. DeYoung? Yes. Mr. Mepelink? Yes. Mr. Bauman? Yes. Mr. Fence? Yes. Mr. Dannenberg? Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. Mr. Bergman? Yes. Motion passes. Uh, under public hearing, there are none. Action items. Um, Mr. Kyers, please. There we go. All right. Um, action number one from the Planning and Policy Committee is the item at Explorers Trail. Suggested motion is to approve and authorize the board chair. The clerk registered to sign the modification to existing agreement with Prine and Newhoff, engineer for design and engineering of the Stearns Bioconnector segment of the item at Explorers Trail in the amount of $281,317.35. Support. Is there support? Support. Thank you. Comments or questions? Barry, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Kyer. Yes. Mr. Hope. Yes. Mr. Garcia. Yes. Mr. Dannenberg. Yes. Mr. DeYoung. Yes. Mr. Zalstra. Yes. Mr. Terpstra. Yes. Mr. Meppel. Yes. Mr. Bauman. Yes. Mr. Fenske. Yes. Mr. Bergman. Yes. Motion passes. Action number two, the item explores ravines connector. And the motion is to approve and authorize the board chair and clerk register to sign the easement and construction agreement with Chad and Tammy Ebel for the item explores trail route along the shoreline of the Grand River at the purchase of $85,000. Support. Been moved and supported. Comments or questions? Jerry, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Garcia? Yes. Mr. Fenske? Yes. Mr. Zalstra? Yes. Yes. Can't hear. Yes. Mr. Can't hear. Mr. Tur yes. Mr. Mappoli? Yes. Mr. Hofler? Yes. Mr. Bauman? Yes. Mr. Kyers? Yes. Mr. DeYoung? Yes. Mr. Bergman? Yes. Motion passes. What was that? Okay. The motion is to approve and authorize the board chair and clerk register to sign the purchase of real estate with E. B Development Company LLC for the purchase 
of 5.5 acres in the Highland Township at the price of $125,000 as part of the Macatawa Greenway in the budding Hawthorne Pond Nature Center. Second. Been moved and seconded. Comments or questions? Carrie, would you call the roll, please? Sure. Mr. Dannenberg? Yes. Mr. Bauman? Yes. Mr. Fenske? Yes. Mr. Mepelink? Yes. Mr. Terpstra? Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. Mr. DeYoung? Yes. Mr. Hoflor? Yes. Mr. Zalstra? Yes. Mr. Kyers? Yes. And Mr. Bergman? Yes. Motion passes. From Finance and Administration, Mr. Bauman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In regards to the 2022 budget calendar, I make a motion to approve the 2022 budget calendar. Four seconds. Second. Moved and supported. Comments or questions? Mr. Chair? Yes. Yeah, April 13th says kickoff week. Uh, what specifically is that or what does that practically entail? Do we have an idea? Karen, you're going to have to go to. Um, yeah. Kickoff week. Uh, Sorry, the kickoff week um, generally is when departments have access to enter their operational budget requests. There's generally a training so that they know how to and what updates are for the 2022 budget. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? If not, Sherry, would you call the roll please? Sure, Mr. Kyers? Yes. Mr. Hofloor? Yes. Mr. Mepelink? Yes. Mr. Terpstra? Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. Mr. Zalstra? Yes. Mr. Zalstra? Yes. Mr. Fenske? Yes. Mr. Dannenberg? Yes. Mr. DeYoung? Yes. Mr. Bauman? Yes. And Mr. Bergman? Yes. Motion passes. Regarding the 2020 budget transfers, I make a motion to approve the budget transfers between appropriations approved by the administrator for 50,000 or less through 930 of 2020. Second. And moved and seconded, comments or questions? Sherry, would you call the roll please? Sure. Mr. Fenske? Yes. Mr. Zalstra? Yes. Mr. Kyers? Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. Mr. Hoflor? Yes. Mr. Bauman? Yes. Mr. DeYoung? Yes. Mr. Mepelink? Yes. Mr. Dannenberg? Yes. Mr. Terpstra? Yes. And Mr. Bergman? Yes. Motion passes. In regards to the cadet tuition reimbursement policy, I make a motion to approve an addendum to the, com or to the county's tuition reimbursement policy to include cadets employed by the sheriff's office. Board. Board. They're moved and supported. Comments or questions? I think Joe was going to fail. Are you gonna, or Steve? <laughs> And our under sheriff is going to uh, give a, a little bit of a, in, uh, some input regarding item number six and number seven, correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Bergman and uh, co chair Fenske and the county board. Um, yeah, but the first thing we have is our cadet reimbursement, um, which what we're looking at is we've had a cadet program for years. And what this is, is these are kids that are interested in going into law enforcement or corrections. And they work right in um, usually our headquarters and they work at our jail facility. They also do training with our uh, deputies. Um, they get a lot of experience uh, basically on the job training with us while they go to a police academy or any type of um, criminal justice program in college. 
we usually find our cadets um, in our local schools with our school resource officers, or we have a career line tech center uh, where we have a public safety program uh, that we get them from. And usually they're high school students just uh, getting out of high school, going into college. So what this does is we have an opportunity to really see uh, what uh, caliber of people they are. We get a chance to start to mentor and grow them and they get a, a familiarity with our agency. So what happens is, is they go and they work here. I probably have seen them in the tan shirts uh, and uniforms and they start to, to get some of that experience, which when they get done with the uh, police academy, uh, normally uh, we look at hiring them with our agency. But what ha what's happening is a lot of our local agencies around here, because of the fact that there's a lot of hiring uh, and a lack of candidates are uh, interviewing sometimes our cadets and we're at risk of losing them because we're not providing the same type of benefits. So with this, we would um, have an application process. Uh, they would have to be employed for a year with us as a cadet, uh, which gives us time to see um, what caliber of person they are. And then what they would do is go to the police academy. They would have to pass that in the MCOLS test as, as well as uh, the FTO program. So uh, once they did that, they could then apply for the tuition reimbursement uh, to do, through the tuition reimbursement program. Are, are there any questions from commissioners regarding uh, this, this program? Well, either either one of the programs, number six or number seven. Seeing none, thanks, Val. Okay, are we ready to vote on number six? Yes. All right, would you call the roll, please, sir? Sure. Mr. Zalstra? Yes. Mr. Fenske? Yes. Mr. Bauman? Yes. Mr. Kyers? Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. Mr. Mepelink? Yes. Mr. Dannenberg? Yes. Mr. DeYoung? Yes. Mr. Holfloor? Yes. Mr. Terpstra? Yes. And Mr. Bergen? Yes. Motion passes. In regards to the law enforcement deputy scholarship program pilot, I make a motion to approve the proposal for a pilot deputy sponsorship program to include non-sworn recruit, recruit positions to be filled by qualified candidates as they attend the GVSU Police Academy sponsored by the Sheriff's Office. Second. So moved. Been moved and seconded. Comments or questions? Sherry, would you call the roll please? Mr. Bauman? Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. Mr. Mepelink? Yes. Mr. Hofloor? Yes. Mr. DeYoung? Yes. Mr. Zalstra? Yes. Mr. Terpstra? Yes. Mr. Kyers? Yes. Mr. Dannenberg? Yes. Mr. Fenske? Yes. And Mr. Bergman? Yes. Motion passes. And finally, this afternoon regarding community mental health personnel requests, I make a motion to approve the request from community mental health to make the following position additions and changes that are listed in the agenda at a total cost of $790,855.44. Support. Been moved and supported. Um, Al, you want to say something about this? You want to just, are these budgeted items or are these... Uh, or this, uh, additional. I'm still muted. Lynn, go ahead. Why don't you summarize this? Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. It's Lynn Doyle here. Um, happy to answer any questions. I realize there's quite a few uh, positions being requested, which is, is new for us. For many years, we were not hiring new folks, um, but uh, I can go through each, uh, each uh, position. I don't think that's necessary. Okay. I don't think that's necessary, Lynn. The, the question I had was, how, how is this 790,000 uh, paid for? 
So uh, it's a combination. There is a grant in there, a COSAP grant, which is Comprehensive Opioid Stimulant and Substance Abuse Program grant that we've already secured. Part of the funding for those jail positions are coming from that grant. Um, there are several positions that um, will be paid for through Medicaid. And then uh, there is uh, one position that we're planning on using millage funds. Okay, does anyone else have any questions of Lynn? If not, thank you, Lynn. And we'll yep, vote. Thank you. Sherry? Mr. Terpstra? Yes. Mr. Hopefloor? Yes. Mr. Zylstra? Yes. Mr. Kyers? Yes. Mr. DeYoung? Yes. Mr. Mepelink? Yes. Mr. Bauman? Yes. Mr. Fansky? Yes. Mr. Dannenberg? Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. And Mr. Bergman? Yes. Motion passes. Next thing is uh, we have appointments that are none, discussion items none. Uh, we have a report by the county administrator. Al? Uh, yes, one main item today would just be that uh, over the past couple weeks, John and Doug and I have participated in about 18 hours of Zoom meetings with the uh, IPD team for the Family Justice Center, uh, intended to build relationships and also finish putting that agreement together. So that's kind of been our, a big chunk of our world for the last couple weeks at least. And that's all. So does anyone have any questions of Al? If not, uh, the next thing is general information, comments, or meetings attended. Anyone? No one, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Um, yeah, last week I got appointed to the um, NACO board. Some of you know that already, but so I'll be on the National Social Counties board. So maybe a little more insight and a little more help from uh, DC as a uh, lobbyist and give them some of our opinion what's going on there. So looking forward to it. I think all for all of us, uh, um, we congratulate you for that. And, uh, you know, the fact that you're on the MAC board and soon to be the, the uh, president of the MAC board, uh, look forward to your uh, leadership there as well. So thank you for uh, participating and, and your leadership on NACO as well. Thank you, Roger. Okay, the next thing on the uh, agenda is public comment. Is there anyone on the public that would like to uh, address the commission at this time? Okay, then I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. It's been moved and supported. All in favor say aye. 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 We're adjourned. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, uh, Thank you for your patience, everyone, and uh, for anyone that might be out there on YouTube. I apologize for the fact that uh, we weren't able to uh, run our meeting normally today, um, and for your patience, uh, I thank you. So thank you all, and with that, I'm